Stephen Polaz is sounding the alarm on fallout from global trade tension as NAFTA talks drag on with no end in sight. The Bank of Canada governor says there's no do-overs for corporate decision makers, a tone that is also shaping the spring economic outlook for Bennett Jones. Joining us now for his latest economic outlook is David Dodge, senior advisor at Bennett Jones and also former Bank of Canada governor standing by for us in Ottawa. David, good to be able to catch up with you today and, and get your understanding and perhaps outlook uh, with what we're seeing in, in these trade negotiations. Tension continues to increase. It's now the G6 plus one. Uh, how are you reading the current situation? Well, Catherine, I don't think anybody professes they really understand the president of the United States. On the other hand, the policies, uh, I think, are more understandable. And that is the White House and the people uh, around the president look at the world that, in a way that if they can create uncertainty about investment elsewhere in the world, then both Americans and foreigners will come and invest more in the United States. And so if we can create, if they can create uh, that degree of uncertainty on the trade side, then they see that as benefiting uh, the United States, at least benefiting the United States insofar as people go there to make their investments. And so I think that is what is really going on, uh, given that the president clearly doesn't understand reasons why the U.S. runs a trade deficit. He does understand what might make the U.S. more attractive as a place to invest. So that's a different take, David, on how the majority of people are really looking at the NAFTA negotiations and trade tensions between the United States and China. You're saying that their strategy is really to create global uncertainty and therefore money will just continue to flow into the United States versus what Trump and Kudlow says, which is that we just want more fair trading and reciprocal trading with our trading partners. You don't buy that? At all? Well, everybody wants fair trade, uh, but uh, like beauty, uh, fair is in the definition of fair is in the eye of the beholder. But yeah, no, I think they understand perfectly uh, that there are ways that the U.S. can become more attractive as a place to invest, uh, and uh, that's what that's what they are going after. They are undermining the WTO as, a, as an organization. Uh, they are definitely America first, and a view that if the rest of the world less, looks less attractive, then somehow America gains. Um, it's a very peculiar view. I, uh, to me, it's a peculiar view, and obviously to our prime minister, it's, it's a peculiar view. But it's clearly one that's there, and it's not one that has been unknown uh, before uh, in the United States. If we go back to the time of Mr. Nixon as president, uh, we, off, we off sometimes had that same view expressed. The one other elephant, though, in the room, I suppose, or, or the, the country that has the economic power to push back against Trump, of course, is China, and that's exactly what they are doing. How does that unfold? Um, we don't know. Uh, we, we certainly don't know. Um, it, it is very hard to see, though, in China's case, that it is in either of their best interests to uh, totally destabilize the relation between the two of them. So I think that is different, whereas if we think of Trump versus Europe, Trump versus Canada, there's a view in the White House that a little instability there really won't have, uh, can't possibly have uh, much of a negative influence uh, on uh, investment in the United States. So I, I, we're talking about uh, a different game vis-a-vis mm -hmm. uh, -vis so-called America's, America's so-called friends uh, and China. What do you think is the right response for Canada to have in this new norm that we're dealing with? 
Well, f first response is to push back, just as uh, the government has done. Obviously, uh, appearing weak is not a good way to uh, way to operate. So, the government did the right thing. Second, they're absolutely right, uh, and Canadian business is absolutely right. Uh, to uh, ensure that we are on good relations with U.S. states, uh, with Congress, uh, and with U.S. business. So the so-called charm offensive makes absolutely, uh, absolutely good sense. And then thirdly, uh, we have just entered into uh, a new TPP arrangement, a new CETA arrangement. Uh, we should be working very hard to exploit uh, those uh, trade arrangements. So I think that is the, the, the way to, to uh, deal with this, which is not a good situation. In fact, uh, the Western world as we have known it, uh, Western economic world as we've known it, uh, certainly uh, uh, since uh, the end of the Second World War, is really changing. And the leadership that the Americans have exerted uh, is really falling away. And what is going to be very interesting uh, is to see whether China, as a model for uh, how other countries op ought to operate, really uh, can surpass, or it's certainly challenging the United States. The question is whether that model becomes more attractive. I would find it very unfortunate were that to be the case. And I think it's unfortunate for Canada but nevertheless, that is the position that the Americans have created. When you talk about the China model, then, what is it that you think would be unfortunate for Canada if it were to evolve more and even take over perhaps the, the model of the world and take it from the United States? Why, why does that put Canada in a worse position versus, quite frankly, probably where we are right now? Uh, oh, because we are... Uh, we are uh, the, the basic economic model that we work on in this country is one of generally uh, a free enterprise, or at least generally of uh, private uh, corporations and decisions being made, uh, uh, dist distributed throughout uh, the economy and private corporations. When one's up against uh, a model where state corporations corporations with the full muscle of the state behind them, that becomes a very different world in which uh, to operate. It's not one that we have uh, been used to operating in. We may have to adjust, uh, but it's certainly not one we've been used to operating in. And I think it makes it uh, a lot tougher uh, for us, at least in the short run, uh, mm -hmm. as we uh, try to adjust. Uh, to those differences. And as we lose the American leadership, uh, which has historically been very valuable to the United States, but very valuable to the rest of the Western uh, world. Why, how do you dovetail the, the two thoughts to me? As you say that the United States is going to lose their leadership and at the same time, President Trump is trying to create uncertainty and therefore you say that money will flow into the United States. It sounds like then they would be not losing leadership. Uh, well, yes, they will. I, I mean, uh, Governor Paulus said it very well that uh, when you create uncertainty for a period of time, uh, then money rushes to where things more seem more certain at that point in time. Uh, that is true in money markets. Uh, we observe that, that uh, when the world is very unstable, people rush to the U.S. dollar. Uh, and where, when markets seem to be more unstable, uh, people want, uh, firms want to be sure that they're inside uh, that border of the largest uh, single uh, Western uh, world uh, market. And so I think in the short run, uh, it, it is attractive. I, I certainly don't agree with it as a long-term uh, strategy. And, and I think there are lots of people in Congress and lots of American businessmen that don't agree with it as a long-term strategy. But uh, in the short run, uh, one can understand mm -hmm. uh, what is going on, and, one, and we have to be prepared uh, to counter that fully, both in terms of uh, our trade actions, 
but also in terms of our own domestic policies to make Canada a more attractive place uh, for firms uh, to make their investment. And that's what I actually wanted to ask you more about, David. You, you know, we've got the short-term impact for sure, but there are longer-term issues at play as well. From a short-term perspective, though, because we will start to feel the pain, I think, of these tariffs, whether it's through consumers feeling it, higher inflation, or just increased tensions, increased uncertainty. What are some of the near-term domestic policies that we should be employing right now that can take action and, and get some results from? Well, policy acts over a, a rather longer period of time. And so, in some sense, there are no, we, we shouldn't be looking to short-term fixes. Uh, we should be looking to what actually will help us, uh, help us over the longer haul. But let me first say that, that the, world, the, the world is growing quite strongly, and the United States is growing very strongly. And that means that there are uh, expanding markets just in volume terms for, for our exports. So that, that is a positive, uh, and we uh, need to try to take advantage of it. On the, to offset some of the negatives uh, that you're really asking the question, how do we make Canada a more competitive place? Mm -hmm. We may have to take some action with respect to taxation where we've lost a, an advantage. But I think even more importantly, it, on our legislative and regulatory front, we need to create uh, a greater degree of, an, of certainty for investors as to the uh, structure of our economy that they're going to face uh, going forward uh, and give them some, un, some certainty that uh, uh, once a regulation is put in place or once a law is passed, that that is going to be there and they can rely on that even if they may not like it, at least they can rely on that and not be subject to uh, a lot of uh, uh, individual uh, influences from outside that make it impossible for them to rely uh, on uh, that legislation, on that regulation, so, uh, or on, on the court decisions that might follow from that. So, David, you're talking about Kinder Morgan, of course. And uh, I'm wondering whether or not you think well, not just Kinder Morgan, not just, but that's the most that, that's almost the catalyst as to why we're talking about it and, and really what's getting uh, the, the message around around the world as it relates to regulation in Canada and, and the certainty in, uh, about doing business here. Um, do you think that the government, the federal government didn't go far enough in, in enforcing their constitutional right? Uh, I, I don't quite know how to answer that. I would say, first of all, uh, first of all, the, the fact that our system is set up which, to allow a lot of uh, local influences, whether that be individual uh, indigenous communities, whether that be provinces, whether that be municipalities, um, uh, uh, to raise questions and challenge, uh, legally challenge uh, the courts and our, our regulatory uh, apparatus uh, seems to, uh, in that sense, be less certain uh, mm -hmm. than it ought to be. Uh, this is, it's, these are not easy questions to solve. Um, uh, clearly, you know, it goes all the way to the Supreme Court, that decision on, uh, on 121 tariff uh, barriers to interprovincial trade, I think was an extraordinarily unfortunate decision, mm -hmm. uh, which opens up further uh, uncertainty as to, uh, as to interprovincial uh, trade and the ability of provinces to inter interrupt uh, transactions. So we actually have created collectively over time, sometimes for good reason, sometimes uh, not really thinking through very well what we were doing. We have created a situation which is less certain. Uh, and even when business might disagree with the objective uh, of a policy, uh, if it's clear and they know they know what the rules of the game are mm -hmm. and that those rules are enforced. 
uh, then that helps decision making. Where does this leave you, taken all together, in your 2018 economic outlook? Uh, it leaves us with growth in 2018 and 19 at around 2%, uh, down a lot from last year, uh, but, uh, but still not, uh, not terrible. Uh, so that's why I said the positive influences of, strong, of a strong world uh, are perhaps on balance slightly greater than the negative influences of these other uncertainty issues. But as we get out to 2020 and 2021, uh, then I think the outlook becomes uh, less robust. Uh, as as uh, Governor Polos has said, uh, we can look, th he's willing to look through uh, a few good quarters uh, if he thinks things are going to settle down differently outside. And I think the risks as we get out to the end of uh, 2020 and into 2021, uh, the risks are for um, uh, for more for a slowdown out there than a continued growth. But this year and next year still look pretty good. Hmm. Okay, we'll leave it on that note. Thank you very much for being with us. Appreciate it. Good to talk to you. Thank you, you too.